Welcome to the Bibliotheca Orientalis. Today we meet again Doris Beres Abuseif, former professor at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies at London. She will talk to us about her book, Minarets of Cairo. One major reason for writing such a, a compendium about the minarets of Cairo is, of course, the minarets of Cairo themselves. I don't think that there is any other city in the Muslim world that has, again, in spite of all losses over time, such a variety of shape in terms of minarets than uh, as Cairo. For example, in Cairo, all kinds of buildings have minarets, where in other cities, for example, the madrasas, the zambias, which are small Sufi shrines, don't have minarets. In, 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 in Turkey, uh, in many parts of the world, the madrasas don't have minarets. But in Cairo, from the beginning, from the earlier period, the minaret appears as attached to everything. This is why what has motivated me, but I was motivated already in the 1980s. And this is the first version of that book, which was published by the American University in Cairo and was sponsored by the Aga Khan uh, uh, program. At that time, there was the book by Crystal, of Crystal Kessler on the masonry domes of Cairo. A small book, but a very interesting book about the masonry domes of Cairo, how they developed, how they changed, and how they became increasingly complex with time, and then how they declined in quality. And I always said, if we have a book on dome, we should have a book on minerals as well. And then one day my friend and mentor and teacher, Laila Al Ibrahim, met me at the American University. And she had came with lots of shoe boxes uh, filled with photographs. And it was just a pie. And she put them in front of me and said, here are pictures, photographs of all the minerals of Cairo. Go ahead and work. And indeed, she had really very good photographs by the antiquity department. And this pushed me, gave me no choice. I began working and I did all the field work. Uh, it was a good, at, at that time I was young and I could climb the very high staircases of I don't know how high they could be of all the minerals I visited. I didn't do that in the second uh, with the remake. So after the, min, uh, the Cairo of the Mamluks, <clears throat> my publisher, oh, Ty Vittorius, was telling me, so what is coming next, what is coming next? And uh, I thought that it's time perhaps to do this remake. They had, he had to use old slides because the urban environment has changed so much. It's being so crowded, you don't see the buildings anymore, or some of the buildings are damaged. Some minerals no longer exist uh, physically, but we have photographs, old photographs. I've been, this was a hobby for me to just go and look in old pictures. What can I find that's no longer extant? Or sometimes also in engravings and paintings and by 19th century artists that uh, uh, had filled some of the gaps. When you look at old painting or old photographs or even the descriptions of travelers who came to Egypt in the pre-modern time, so they go to the see them from the far afar, uh, all the silhouettes of the city with all these minarets, the minarets that are the landmark. That are Cairo has 12,000 mosques. Simply because they could see all these minarets one next to the other and it doesn't matter if they are very close, sometimes the muezzins would even uh, one uh, overlap because they were so close. This was meant also. It was the architecture of the individual building at the same time as the urban composition to have this density uh, of mineral. And this is something which is disappearing today because of the uh, density. Variations became very important. And again, when we come to the Mamluk period, where we have the biggest number and the greatest variation is since there were so many buildings and the buildings were personal memorials to the founders. So every building had to look different. So the idea was to play with variations and sometimes variation in the details. So uh, it is when, when you look at them just one after the other, you notice that. 
In the Ottoman period, there's more standardization. And so I have for the Ottoman period, which is much longer period, it's almost 400 years, less and a smaller number of minarets than those of the Mamluk period. And the variation is also in the details of the stone carving. And uh, you have, for example, uh, uh, three balconies in the Mamluk minarets usually. Every balcony has a different pattern of bukanas. They are never repeated. It's only when they did restoration in the 19th century, copying the old minaret, they didn't realize that. So sometimes they, they did that, made the same composition of bukanas or stalactites in all the three mina, in all the three balconies. But originally, each one here and here and here has a different design, a different composition. I think the idea is really to, to make them decorative not only functional and different, different. and uh, with time, it's also it's very interesting in terms of study of masonry, because at the beginning of the earlier period, the minerals were in brick, then they begin being made of brick and stone, and and when the, the, the architecture gets really mature, it's only stone, and then they can become more slender and more elaborate. Again, it's not only the architecture and the carving and the design, but what the minarets meant in urban life. So part of the book also deals with the function of the minaret, the non-religious function, the non-strict religious function, and the non-architectural function in the city, in the life of the city. I think the function is aesthetic, it's a landmark, it's here I am, the mosque, the founder, the patron. And uh, the, I think when we come especially to the Mamluk period again, you have a double uh, kind of initiative. The private one, everyone wants to have his own mosque, every important person, and their own minaret, and their own mosque. And there's also, there's a kind of, I think there's also a kind of collective thinking that you add to the city. It's not only my mineral, but there's also the idea, or oh, another one could be added to the uh, uh, panorama or to the collection of minarets which Cairo displays. But these beautiful minarets, especially also the Mamluk periods, were no longer built after 1517, after the Ottoman conquest. I've always wondered, was there perhaps a regulation that you should not build in the Mamluk style but only the Ottoman style minaret, or was it simply for other reasons? I cannot answer this. I always raised the question, but I couldn't answer it. Anyway, in the Ottoman period, it is between 1517 and, let's say, uh, almost World War I, uh, uh, we have the, the mosques that were built and um, are mostly Ottoman style minaret, but not Ottoman in the style or the scale of the Istanbul minaret. But provincial version of the Ottoman minaret, and they were usually with very little variations. So in the 19th century, when for political reasons, emancipation from the Ottoman Empire, the modernization, also with the help of Orientalism, the idea of Egyptian identity came up very strong, and this is the time when the nostalgia for the Mamluk period as the Golden Age came up. And this is also the time when the neo-Mamluk style of architecture was invented. It was mostly a Western invention. And ever since from the late 19th century until not long time ago, the neo mamluk style was the style of all mosques in Egypt, but not only in Egypt, because many Egyptian architects migrated to acquire the Arab world. So you find the neo mamluk mosque in Abu Dhabi, you find them even in Iraq, you find it in the Gulf, and now, in the very recent decade, there is a distance, uh, there's something else happening. I hope that this will bring creativity. I think the era of the neo Mamluk now is finally gone, and perhaps it's good that it is. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and share it. We are looking forward to hearing from you through the comment section. If you want to remain updated and be notified about our future videos, please subscribe the YouTube channel. Thank you.